Hello everyone, this is Alisa Baum, Grid Gains Director of Product Marketing. We'll begin in just a moment, but first I need to conduct some housekeeping. Could you please raise your hand using the hand icon located in the GoToWebinar control panel to let me know if you can hear me? And let me take a look. Okay, thank you, I see your hands. Next, during this webinar, you'll be on mute, but should you have any questions during the discussion, feel free to enter them in the questions field within the control panel. At the end of the webinar, we'll take time to answer as many questions as possible. And if we don't get to all the questions, we'll be doing a follow-up blog entry on Grid Gains blog. In addition, I'll make sure that each of you has a recording link for this webinar and the slides within the next 48 hours, probably a lot sooner than that, but give me 48 hours. Um, I would like to thank you for attending today's webinar. It's called Enabling Bitcoin and Blockchain Technology with In-Memory Computing. It's being presented by industry consultant, Eric Cartman. And with that said, I'll turn the floor over to you. Eric, go ahead. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. I know it's a global webcast, so I'm uh, hoping that uh, you can join and the time is convenient uh, as we try to find a time that works for most of the people. Um, so uh, again, my name is Eric Cartman. I'm an independent consultant in the area of financial technology mainly, and that's where I've spent more than 25 years doing this stuff for different banks, for different uh, trading organizations, for different uh, uh, retail organizations, as well as uh, the te technology companies. And um, today we're it's a next uh, uh, series in our uh, next episode in our series uh, where we're presenting how grid gains uh, in memory data fabric can help to achieve uh, better results for different financial applications and financial needs. And we've covered uh, areas of, uh, of uh, different uh, you know, financial issues that are arising, um, you know, or technology issues that are arising and fi how financial companies deal with them. And so today is no exception. One of the hottest topics uh, nowadays is blockchain. Uh, most of the larger banks are investigating this area. Most of the, uh, a lot of technology companies are building platforms that uh, uh, enable blockchains for financial services firms. Uh, there are billions of dollars are invested into this field. So we cannot pass this by and I wanted to spend this uh, hour with you to kind of cover what this is all about, what Bitcoins uh, is are about why blockchain specifically is so interesting to financial services firms. And then uh, we'll cover a little bit about uh, um, technology innovations that, uh, are, that now are coming up out of this blockchain revolution. And uh, we'll also talk about grid gain and where I can cover some of our products and explain how our functionality and our technical advantages uh, actually uh, make uh, blockchains even more effective. That's going to be the discussion for today. Uh, I think if you have any questions, please do raise hand and then I'll uh, be spending, you know, 10, 15 minutes at the end covering, uh, answering the questions. So uh, what are the current issues with financial ecosystem? Why uh, blockchain? Why all this idea behind this? Well, we first need to go back what's going on uh, within the financial system today. There's definitely a lack of trust. We've seen banks coming in and disappearing. We've seen uh, lots of uncertainty, lots of um, uh, mistrust in terms of the counterparty. Uh, uh, risk and mistrust there. Uh, who do you deal with? Whom do you trust your money? Whom do you trust uh, your payments? All of this is uh, uh, you know, a topic of uh, extreme importance and everybody understands this and something needs to be done about this. Second thing is, I believe, for legacy systems and processes. If we look into the financial services companies today, most of them uh, have problems with the systems of some sort. There are lots of systems. There is a little connection between them. Lots of uh, 
pools of data, uh, islands we call them of data, uh, that uh, sort of live independently of each other and uh, legacy systems have trouble of access, uh, uh, accessing data uh, within those different systems and different pools of uh, data. There are too many intermediaries. Right. If we look into the any of the trade-related processes or payments processes or any uh, you know uh, financial transaction processing uh, today, we'll see that there are lots of intermediaries. There's a source. There's destination. There are validations. There are locations. There's lots of different uh, uh, processes in the in this in this mix, and uh, in many cases, those processes take a long time, and um, uh, you know sometimes it's an overnight process. Sometimes it's a real time process. Sometimes it's a, a batched oriented processing. Uh, it takes a long time to go through all those points. Uh, especially, this is especially true in the post-trade functions. If execution within a trading business uh, at least uh, it makes more sense, you know, we've gone through straight through processing and few other automation initiatives in this space. Uh, then in a the post-trade space, still there are lots of uh, complexity and slowness and intermediaries and uh, difficulty uh, of processing those functions. And uh, well, if you have a lot of functions, if you have a lot of processes, you obviously up for reconciliation, because you know within financial system everything has to work smoothly. You cannot lose any records. Um, everything is sequential, so you need to make sure that uh, after each process, uh, you know all your transactions are accounted for, and uh, therefore you need reconciliation after each process. So that creates lots of additional uh, uh, store, records uh, keeping, records checking, records enrichment, uh, and creates additional complexity, of course. And plus, we, have, we are living in a heavily uh, regulated environment right now, after, especially after financial crisis of 2008-2010. We are operating in a heavily compliant era where all transactions need to be checked for regulatory uh, compliance, for different rules um, within banking, within trading, within payments, lots of validations, lots of rules checking. And finally, financial fraud that does not add uh, more to the trust, uh, it's more to the mistrust as uh, we know how many fraudulent transactions occur and that creates also lack of trust as you don't know whether the transaction you received has actually come from the a reliable source and how do you guarantee this? There are smarter and smarter ways the fraudsters are trying to uh, work with the system and uh, create transactions which appear from multiple places to be normal but actually not. So how do you do this? How do you uh, uh, fight that uh, financial fraud uh, problem? So that's the reality. Not very uh, bright, but at the same time, uh, need to do something about this. So let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin, uh, so we understand um, uh, where this uh, Bitcoin and blockchains idea comes from. So Bitcoin is a, it's a cryptocurrency, right? Full, a full electronic currency, without any central bank authority, uh, that uses a mechanism of mining, what we call it, to introduce new currency into circulation. So there's no central bank that will say, okay, we'll take uh, these coins out, we'll add more dollar bills in, and that's how we will uh, deal with uh, uh, the additional liquidity, or taking liquidity, or uh, adding liquidity into the financial system. Here you have a mechanism where you can, uh, uh, you know, do certain actions that will perform certain tasks and as a result uh, you'll collect a small amount of bitcoins and that's how new bitcoins are being introduced and then of course you can sell and buy them uh, within the market but that's how the new coins are being uh, introduced. Um, interest, few interesting points around this, right? So the bitcoin 
system has been around, right? So it's uh, a lot of people like that this lacks the central bank authority uh, regulations especially uh, due to many countries that add on this additional um, regulations in terms of how much money can leave the country, how much money can come in, what type of uh, reports you have to associate with, uh, you know, if you're over a certain threshold. Uh, normally with Bitcoins you are free from that obligation. Um, so. A lot. So some countries that have that strict uh, rules, you know, China and lots of Asian countries, Eastern European countries, um, some African and uh, Latin American countries. Uh, so that's, those are the areas where Bitcoins have been growing the fastest. Um, also, uh, because of the uh, Bitcoin in mining, uh, it requires a lot of resources, computing resources, electricity, um, human power to enable some of the, some of that uh, processing. Um, as a result, we see that today about 70% of Bitcoin mining is done in China. And this is not surprising, there are specific large uh, data, uh, data centers are being built specifically for this purpose to, uh, uh, to uh, generate on a mass scale bitcoins and, uh, uh, you know, uh, enlarge, uh, enlarge uh, uh, the collection of those bitcoins in, uh, you know, several people's hands or several in uh, several uh, firms' uh, hands. So that's how it's done there. Uh, also, about I believe 60%. I think the numbers I'd seen of all Bitcoin transactioning is uh, occurring in China as well. So that's uh, probably one of the largest uh, users today. But also other areas are picking up, and uh, uh, practically today you can find most of uh, um, most of the types of purchases you wanted to make uh, in Bitcoins one way or another. And there are not too many of them, but you can still find uh, stores and online stores and online uh, brokerages and other online institutions that will accept uh, Bitcoins for payments. Um, so let's go back to how this whole thing started. Well, it started uh, quite interestingly as a uh, an electronic micropayments idea about uh, 25 years ago or so, uh, where uh, basically, you know, if you go to, um, you know, to a, a store or anywhere else, and you wanted to use your credit card, right? Normally, you have some kind of minimum associated with uh, the charge that you can put on a credit card because of uh, you know 200 basis points or so that, uh, uh, that normally the credit card charges for the transaction. So if the, um, if the charge is small, I don't know, under a dollar or under 50 cents or whatever, then it doesn't matter, you know, then the, the, basically the company is losing money by accepting that payment from you if it comes through a credit card. So therefore, they came out with this idea. Well, what do, so the idea was like, how do we create uh, a framework, electronic framework, that will allow for those micro payments to go through without paying uh, those uh, huge uh, uh, fees to the credit cards. So that's how this whole idea started. Uh, but obviously, it grew more into. Um, other areas within uh, payments, you know, in the, some larger payments started to come through because normally the, uh, the the basis points, the fees are significantly smaller than any of the other mediums that exist, wire transfers, uh, uh, check payment, uh, credit card payment, whatever, right? You still need an infrastructure, you still need an intermediary to process those payments. And here, uh, I will explain in a sec how it's done, but here you uh, basically need a much smaller input into or, or footprint into the infrastructure to process bitcoins. Um, bitcoins are also exchanged for traditional currency. There are a bunch of virtual exchanges that exist where you can actually you know, go in and sell and buy your bitcoins if you need them uh, and exchange them with the real dollars or real pounds or real whatever. Uh, um, uh, currency you're using, 
and then you're doing it back and forth. You can also uh, sell, and you can you know you can you can uh, uh, sell uh, those coins and receive those dollars back into your uh, wallets, uh, electronic wallets. Uh, if you look at the performance of bitcoins, it's incredible. The bitcoins has surged more than four thousand percent since just two thousand eleven. Right? That's incredible growth, and people are also looking into this and saying, oh, well, if it's growing like that, maybe there is a potential. Maybe we can invest into Bitcoins like we do invest into more traditional asset classes and seeing if uh, we can get uh, some growth potential here. Um, Bitcoins, as I mentioned, are stored in electronic wallets. Right, that's how uh, the, in, electronically you can collect them and you can exchange them. And from those bit, uh, from those wallets, you can pay to whichever party you wanted to pay in bitcoins. You can receive uh, those bitcoins from any other party, and then you can you you know you can uh, send them to the to be exchanged on the uh, virtual exchanges. Um, so those are the bitcoins, and the bitcoins are stored. The way that the records are about bitcoins, who has how many bitcoins, who is sending bitcoins to whom, all of that is stored in this technology called blockchain. So now, what's a blockchain and why now? So as I mentioned, the, uh, the bitcoins transactions are using the technology called blockchain, and blockchain is a and this is a very important the choice of words as I'm putting them here because each word means a lot in this uh, context. Uh, so, be, so blockchain is a sequential, right? You have block by block, block one, block two, block three. Each one is connecting to each other. We have permanent, uh, meaning that n never a block can be removed or deleted. It's there forever and it's there in its own place. Right? So the uh, blockchain can only grow, cannot be uh, changed, reduced. Uh, it's encrypted, so all the data within the blockchain is stored in a secure, encrypted way that only the uh, sender and receiver can uh, send and uh, receive and uh, view the contents of a block. It is decentralized, right, uh, because ledger of transactions, so meaning that there is no central bank, as I said, we don't have a central authority that looks after those transactions and each one is just being added and uh, available to everybody, right? So that's the ledger of transactions that's verified and confirmed by random computers uh, anywhere within the network and distributed to any subscribers. So meaning that uh, the way that it works is that each transaction to make sure that it's a, a, it's a valid transaction is being sent randomly to any computer that's subscribing to the network and that computer can verify that this transaction has been received uh, and the contents, uh, it's a valid, it's coming from the source and it's going to the destination, it's validating this uh, and then it's, uh, there is a small amount of fee that's being uh, given to the valid uh, to, to 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 the validating party to make sure that there are lots of you know, lots of validators uh, on the network to sort of uh, approve the transaction in, in in a sort of a virtual way of approval, and then distributed to any subscribers so anybody at all can subscribe and view the transactions, view the logs, view the blocks uh, in an encrypted way so they don't see the contents necessarily but they see. Uh, every every uh, block uh, with an encrypted uh, information there. Some of the uh, interesting statistics I wanted to share with you about blockchain. Um, so this is from the Deutsche Bank and, uh, and Financial Times uh, survey of about 200 financial industry participants, which uh, only took place last month. Right. So uh, according to that survey, 75 percent. Uh, of the ones that got surveyed from the financial industry uh, participants expect widespread, widespread adoption of blockchain within the next three to six years, 75%. Two-thirds expect the introduction of blockchain to produce substantial savings, possibly up to 25%. 48% argue that blockchain technology could also help the financial industry cope with the risk of system failures and market disruption. And 87% of market participants believe blockchain technology will completely change the settlement process for securities. 
That's a significant amount of people. And that's a lot of problems now occur within that uh, um, settlement process. We'll I'll cover this uh, shortly. Um, so just a couple of things that I wanted to kind of uh, explain again for the blockchain. Well, to me, I call it the Internet of Trust. Right, because you have the internet, just like the internet, you have all subscribers, all willing parties can connect to the internet. There is no validation. Uh, anybody can participate on the internet. Uh, and the same thing here, so you have this open network idea. And then it's a trusted, a trusted network because, again, you cannot really influence somebody who is validating uh, the transaction because that person or that computer is unknown to you and there are lots of them and you don't know which one is going to receive it. It's randomly decided. Uh, also, I like the, to think of it as a cloud because, again, we are, all of those computers are connecting to each other in a way because they can view, they can communicate with the blockchain and they can add records and they can remove, I mean, they can view records. Um, all of that is available in an open uh, interface that, to me, it reminds me of a cloud. And then also uh, tendency to decentralize and peer-to-peer. -peer. I think that's kind of uh, the world in which we are operating right now. Uh, there's a tendency to decentralize and peer-to-peer, -peer, like, you know, we all use Uber, we all go to Amazon, we all go to uh, Airbnb, you know, we, we like less centralization, less authority, the way that we transact business, and like peer-to-peer -peer direct connection, PayPal and things like that, right, direct connections uh, of the parties to each other without uh, much of a centralization. So that's, I think, the key idea here with the blockchain. There are problems also that we have with uh, bitcoins and blockchains that are uh, apparent to uh, need to be also uh, talked about, and uh, they always come up in the conversations about uh, blockchains. Well, it's kind of user unfriendly in a way that uh, you need to set up a wallet, you need to do your mining in case if you wanted to generate new uh, bitcoins, you need to set up certain encryption parameters, so it's not something that can be easily set up. Um, there is some, I, you know, some discussion about hacking that we've seen some bitcoins disappearing from sites. We hear them every now and then. So there are still some ways that the system can be hacked in a way. There are system failures. Again, we we see that sometimes you have, you know, if you lose connection to the internet, if you lose connection to your blockchain, uh, uh, then you know there's not much you can do. There's no paper record. It's all electronic. Um, it's high volatility. Is you know we as you know I mentioned earlier that we the uh, the value of bitcoins grew about four thousand percent, but at the same time it's up and down. You know maybe ten percent, five percent on a daily basis. So it fluctuates tremendously, much higher than any of the other currency or most of the other assets. Still limited acceptance, as I mentioned. Yes, you can find. Uh, you can find uh, online um, stores and mer merchants who accept it, but it's still not a widespread uh, situation. You still have, uh, you know, you have to look for those that accept it. Um, and I think one of the uh, issues why it's not accepted uh, at a higher rate is because of high volatility and because of all of the other reasons that I'm mentioning here in this page. Uh, you have the password-based authentication, and uh, we believe that it's uh, not a greatest authentication, right? So, passwords are failing. That's my next point. So, you have to remember the passwords. Sometimes, uh, password can be stolen. So, then there may need to be additional tokens of authentication in addition to the passwords, how they are uh, used today. Uh, governments around the world are looking uh, with a uh, heavier scrutiny into how the uh, bitcoins and blockchains operate, right? They stay understand that well. There are certain currency controls. There are certain limits that the government puts in, and 
essentially what uh, big coins do uh, around this is uh, uh, you know just going through a shortcut or going through another opening within the system and uh, uh, the government loses control of that and they are looking into how to protect themselves and how to uh, uh, legalize how to put a certain legal framework around this and uh, that also uh, deals with even fi even um, commercial uh, transactions, not only governments, right? Still, there is no clear legal framework. What happens if somebody tries to send and does not deliver? What happens if the you know the if the uh, cyber uh, cyber money gets stolen? How do you mitigate this? I mean, there's still very little of uh, legal uh, work that had been done in this area up to this point. Uh, and then I mentioned to you about 80% or so of the mining power is in China in one country. So that also tells you that uh, you know some people are concerned. I've heard some of those concerns. They're saying that well, if it's just so much in one country, what if there's a problem with that country? What if there's a, a little, some kind of a limit uh, or, or um, exercising more? That country is trying to going to try to exercise more control over the process. Uh, that makes this whole principle somewhat uh, less independent than it promised to be. And then, like with any other new technology, trust comes with time, and uh, you know, not a lot of people wanted to experiment right away with uh, blockchains because of these problems, or because just uh, they are not comfortable trying new new technology, which they are not certain about yet. Still, as I mentioned, uh, the banks on large financial institutions, uh, uh, registry houses, custodians, uh, payment centers, they're all looking into blockchains because they believe that, well, if they, those, those issues can be resolved and if the benefits promised by this uh, technology ideas really finalizes, then they have a great way of uh, benefiting from this, that there will be a fewer counterparties, there will need to be uh, fewer checks done in the system, there will need to be only a couple of records sent in and out uh, of this uh, of this process. So that's uh, basically um, how, you know, how the, what the main interest of the financial services uh, firms uh, are about this area. And here I just uh, put, a, put out some uh, uh, more, I, you know, some ideas and some concepts that I've uh, read about, that I've heard about, I've consulted on, uh, you know, that people are looking into this, and I think that's a good, a good set of uh, uh, our sort of first, um, f first set of uh, use cases that uh, we will, we should see within the next. Uh, couple of years of financial services moving to. So like netting, matching, and clearing is uh, related to the to post-trade processing, back office processing, as I mentioned earlier. Collateral management is more on the clearing side as well. Uh, payments, right, all the payment hubs are now looking into how to process those payments in a cheaper and more reliable fashion. Uh, trade finance, uh, obviously, also a lot of parties involved and lots of reconciliations and transactional uh, resources spent on this. Uh, same, day, same day settlement is interesting as we are moving uh, from T plus 3 to T plus 2 to T plus 1, right, T plus 0. I mean, there, there are, um, uh, uh, there are, you know, there, there is a clear movement of uh, reducing the number of days that you need to settle trade. And uh, obviously blockchains, uh, with my uh, test that I've done with a blockchain, you basically can complete the full transaction within 15 minutes or so from the time you send it to the time you, the other side uh, also uh, receives and sends uh, information and the validator validates it and the, the, the transaction is, uh, is clear. So the whole process took about 15 minutes. So obviously same day settlement could be a reality if that is uh, in the intent here. Uh, so and then overall security servicing and processing is uh, a big area as well where you may need to uh, understand uh, what some of the actions, you know, maybe there's uh, uh, some corporate actions done on securities, dividends being paid or anything like that, then this can be added on to 
a block uh, blockchain as well let's say and then anybody who is subscribing to information about that security can immediately receive it uh, directly from the source uh, transfer agents uh, agency and register functions also big area where again uh, the, co the company wants to know who their shareholders are and as the, the shareholders uh, ownership uh, changes uh, again it's a long process by the time that uh, the, the, the company uh, will, will, will know about it here again within the same day you can have that all those functions uh, taken care of with the blockchain um, equilibrium and decentralization of players is also an interesting idea that uh, you know you don't want larger players to kind of control some of this as we have uh, you know large custodians large uh, depositories large uh, transfer agencies and so on that sort of control the market this way it's going to be easy for small players to also play a role here as they don't need to uh, invest a lot of money into the infrastructure it's all going to be using same shared infrastructure of, of the blockchain uh, and then finally the private versus blockchain uh, um, uh, you know this is more of a concept but uh, nonetheless it's uh, uh, you know in order for you to launch any of the other uh, use cases you need to decide well do you really trust the public blockchain and you want to use the same network that uh, uh, today uh, bitcoins use or you may want to build your own blockchain uh, uh, where only uh, sort of uh, valid participants are allowed to be in. But then you need to create a governance of some sort, uh, and uh, that may uh, be kind of uh, defeat the purpose of uh, being fully independent uh, network. So here I'm just giving you an example to sort of illustrate um, and what we do with uh, processing of securities or something like that is how many steps are involved and what is going on here. So, for example, to process a letter of credits, this is just a, a sample of just a few steps that I've uh, highlighted. Not all of the steps, but just the idea is this. Import the files for letter of credit, import a bank approves letter of credit, and import a bank sends letter of credit to export a bank, export a bank approves letter of credit, export a ship's goods and it sends invoice to import it, import a sends invoice to import a bank, import a bank reviews the invoice and sends to export a bank, export a bank reviews and accepts the invoice, import and export a several transaction. Right, so it's just an idea how many steps that are needed to be done and uh, how many uh, transactions, how much information needs to go out, right? With the blockchain, we can pretty much, uh, you know, bring this down to just two transactions, right? When the importer, uh, you know, well, basically the importer sends a request, exporter uh, fulfills the request and uh, that it, you know, then they can everybody else, everybody else involved, all those banks, all those other uh, intermediaries in the process can just view the authentic uh, block uh, details of the importer and exporter, and then uh, make their own steps based on those two transactions. Uh, this is another example where I'm explaining, you know, I'm showing you distributed post trade functions. And I'm using different colors here on purpose, just to show you that I'm behind each color, there is a, a different agency, different uh, type of organization, type of intermediary that's going to be involved, like trade enrichment and reg, you know, maybe by the by the prime broker and then regulatory reporting and prime brokerage by. Well, the trade enrichment by the asset manager and the regulatory reporting and prime brokerage by the prime broker, allocation by the allocation service like uh, Omgeo, for example. Then you have matching information that's normally done again by uh, a custodian of some sort or some some kind of uh, a process in, the, in in between. Then there's a confirmation. There are some confirmation services out there. There's, then there's a netting, collateral management, compression, default management, innovation. All of this is usually again done by uh, some kind of a third party uh, depository of some sort and there's a custodian functions and then a settlement and asset servicing there are lots of processes lots of intermediaries again if the trade details were available on a block within a blockchain all of those parties could read it and could process it uh, without necessarily going through daily exercises end of the day processing uh, and so on
and all the unnecessary reconciliations that are done. So that's basically uh, what the blockchain uh, can do for us and uh, the bitcoins around us. Now I wanted to spend maybe 10 minutes or so to go over uh, grid gains, uh, the memory grid computing and grid gains stand there and to show you what kind of information and how we can uh, benefit from, from all of this. How can this one system, let's say, that can publish records, can be sequential, can do analytics on those records, can be secure, uh, and that's what uh, grid gain can offer to you in implementing such a system. So, for example, you know, so let's just start with an in-memory grid computing. Uh, first of all, we are moving here, obviously, from disk to memory, right, to RAM. That's the idea here, and then we, because of that, we are hundreds of times faster than a traditional data environment. And you know, we have big data. We have a lot of data, and obviously, uh, you know, blockchain with lots of data, as I mentioned, as you keep storing all this information and you keep analyzing this data, it's going to be really big. It's going to only grow. So this would be uh, this means that you can process the data on that blockchain significantly faster, hundreds of times faster. Um, just to show you that uh, gain is uh, already successful in financial services firms, and a lot of them are looking heavily into blockchains, right? So we've done work with City Markets, Bank, uh, uh, Jeffries, Barclays, and so on. You know, and a bunch of other banks are now uh, in the POC stage or uh, close to moving into product, you know, moving uh, uh, applications into production. They all look into grid gain for trading platforms, for financial analytics, risk management, big data, compliance and monitoring, and uh, financial software as a service platforms where there are actually some um, technology firms that are looking into uh, grid gain to, to, to offer software as a service platform uh, around their um, uh, blockchains implementation. Let me just show you, explain to you what uh, one of on one of the use cases what uh, what we're doing here. So this is a use case of a largest bank in Russia and Eastern Europe, and the third largest in in Europe um, called Sberbank. And basically, they had an issue with uh, uh, constant growth of data and dependency on uh, traditional Oracle uh, databases. And uh, um, you know, it was really difficult for them to handle uh, this on, on such a scale, where they had 130 million customers, uh, hundreds of thousands of um, uh, ATM machines, branches, uh, online banking, uh, mobile banking, and so on. It's just uh, incredibly difficult to manage this massive uh, data uh, depository. So uh, they were testing us where they've tested uh, uh, this uh, grid gain system with 1 billion transactions per second uh, on 10 Dell R610 blades with 1 terabyte of memory. So they basically built a grid with 1 terabyte and, and they were receiving about 1 billion transactions per second over a cost of about $25,000 for the hardware, right? So as you can see, quite affordable, incredible speeds, uh, fault tolerance and scalability, uh, fully sequential, full, full transactional consistency, which is really important for any transactional, uh, financial transactional systems, including those that you're going to be building blockchains on. And uh, this is just a, uh, you know, from an RBC article in January of this year, where a CEO of Sberbank mentioned us by name and says that, well, we've uh, looked into all the top firms like Oracle, IBM, and others, and the, the performance and the reli uh, reliability that we've seen uh, from grid gain is unmatched. And uh, what are we doing in hours? Uh, we are now able to do in minutes. Uh, what we could do in weeks, we do it in hours. So it's it's an incredible proof of confidence from a top uh, the top person at the bank who had seen uh, our uh, the results of uh, uh, the work that we've done. Another uh, interesting use case is from uh, Silver Spring Networks, where they uh, basically install smart meters for electricity and uh, other uh, uh, other uh, types of uh, 
power uh, cons consumption within homes and businesses and they collect all this information and they can send bills electronically there's no need to visit anybody in uh, in uh, at home or and uh, you know they collect all this they analyze all the usage and, and they need to do it in real time and again they've looked at a number of different systems and when they uh, came to great gain they saw that well this uh, memory uh, processing and computing is really great and uh, scalable and they can uh, use it to, the, to, to, to what exactly they needed to do. Uh, another uh, example is uh, from one of the largest uh, online consumer electronics stores, right, that uh, also uses our technology for to do in memory and real-time in memory analytics and, uh, uh, you know, great uh, transactional consistency as well with uh, all the different uh, purchases that goes in. Well, kind of this makes sense that now is the right time to to use uh, a technology like this as the uh, as I mentioned as I show you in uh, shown this in the Sberbank example that the costs of memory drop significantly and uh, the performance you get is also incredible. Um, so grid gain is based on Apache Ignite, fully open source technology. And that's where we believe that, uh, you know, the open source is great for uh, grow, the growing uh, community of our users who contribute uh, to the growth and success of the, of the open source product, but also the enterprise edition adds the enterprise class features that the large banks, large financial institutions usually require. So this way you can marry both worlds, the, you know, the, the, the advantages of the open source and plus the advantages of uh, the enterprise class features. Uh, and um, what's in memory data fabric? It's basically a high performance in memory platform where you add the compute and the data on the same grid and you uh, stream the data and you're able to analyze the data in real time in a super fast uh, fashion. And, um, you know, we are able to support all the high-performance computing, machine learning technologies, big data, batch processing, real-time analytics, a lot of, you know, as well as fault tolerance and full enterprise reliability, which is required if you were to build something uh, of a scale of a blockchain, for example. And then it's fully flexible. You have a lot of... Uh, different uh, uh, APIs that support the grid. So you can connect to it through SQL, you can connect through C++, .NET, Java, Hadoop, again, around structured and unstructured data. So quite flexible uh, uh, system. And here, just a couple of benefits I wanted to add on to what I've described. That's really important for building a blockchain system. Obviously, you have a high throughput and low latency because you have a lot of uh, systems accessing uh, this at the same time. Uh, you have uh, scale, you know, the system is scalable as the data is growing. You can easily add more, uh, uh, more uh, components into the grid and then uh, being, being, getting to the scale that you need. It's fully full, uh, full tolerant and uh, uh, with high availability and uh, automatic failover and full repli replication. Uh, data streaming is fully supported and then it's super secure. I mentioned you, know, uh, you need a special level of security and encryption to run a blockchain, so all this, uh, the public key and uh, private key, uh, pairs, uh, authentication, authorizations, auditing, all of this is fully supported uh, on the system. And just again to illustrate, you know, so you, you know, Apache Ignite is basically supports all of the functions in uh, except some of the enterprise-ready features like uh, additional security, additional um, data center replication, additional uh, protection, uh, and and management. And that's uh, pretty much all I wanted to cover. It's about uh, 2.45, so uh, I will leave it for about 10-15 uh, minutes for any questions uh, that you might have. 
Okay, audience, if you have any questions, go ahead and enter them in the questions portion of the GoToWebinar control panel. And while I'm waiting, I just want to make you aware of a couple of other webinars coming up in our financial services series. On January 11th, Eric will be presenting on the topic of asset and wealth management. And then on uh, the 8th of February, he'll be doing a presentation on retail banking and in-memory computing. So I um, encourage you to attend. Um, and we'll be adding more throughout the year as well. So um, with that said, Eric, there are no questions at the moment. So um, I'd like to thank you for the presentation today. And audience, I'd like to thank you for attending, and we hope to see you on a future show. Eric, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.